Father God, we thank you once again for your word that has been preserved, uh, recorded for our benefit, so that we might uh, come to understand more about you, who you are, and what you've done for us. We pray that uh, by the reading and understanding of your word, we're prepared for godly service, that we're motivated by the proper motivators, and that we have our faith always in the correct object. We pray all these things, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Right, and you may be seated. <clears throat> so we are continuing in Genesis. You'll be hearing me say that for at least the next year. Um, we'll take a break. Don't worry. After chapter 11, we'll take a break and do First John. But we come to the most sinister character in Scripture yet. In fact, we come to the first person who we meet that there is no evidence that this man is saved. Uh, <clears throat> we don't know how the Lord worked with him in later parts of his life, but where Cain's story ends for us, he ends in rebellion. So this is yet another solemn passage for us to see the downfall of mankind. I want to give you our main point up front again so you can think about it as we go through the sermon that man must rightly respond to God's grace, that when God offers grace, we have a responsibility to respond to it appropriately, be that before salvation or after. Uh, God offers grace to the believer in the family of God, and he offers grace to the unbeliever in offering him the opportunity to become part of the family of God through spiritual birth. So we look first at these two sons born to Adam and Eve. And this is in fulfillment of God's promise that the seed of the woman would continue, that life would come from the woman, that although man is destined to die, God will preserve them. And last night I was thinking again of what Israel would have thought when they received this from Moses. And I don't know where exactly in the 40 years of their wandering they received this, but they had been sentenced to death. The generation that came out of Egypt was told that they would not enter the promised land, but that their children would. Eve as well had been promised that she would have children and that they would receive a savior. So this would have been very meaningful for Israel to see that God does fulfill his promises of bringing up later generations and that families do have a responsibility to teach their children the word of God, what God said. And that's exactly what is happening this morning in this section of Genesis, that Adam would have instructed his children in the proper sacrifice to bring before the Lord. And one was responsible and brought that proper sacrifice. And another was rebellious and chose to bring the work of his own hands and not a blood sacrifice. But first, let's look at the birth of these two sons. In Genesis 4, 1, it says, now the man had relations with his wife and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. Whenever a word is, uh, or a euphemism is used instead of an explicit word. There is question by liberal scholars of, does it actually mean what it says it means? Well, whatever relations does mean, the result was conceiving a child. Uh, so the text is pretty clear here what this means. The result of man's relations with Eve was Cain. This was a human born from Cain with the same sin nature as Cain. And his sin nature is going to be highlighted. But what Eve highlights demonstrates her faith, first of all, and it demonstrates proper doctrine, but it also demonstrates improper application of good doctrine. So she understood God's promise. In fact, she understood it better than we do when we just read it in a cursory reading. But she applied it a little too hastily. She says, or actually, I'm getting ahead of myself here. She calls him Cain, uh, which is similar to 
the root word for gotten. She got a man and she named him Cain, gotten. Whatever he is, he is something she understands to have received. This is the same word used for Boaz when he receives Ruth and when he receives as the kinsman redeemer those things which belonged to Naomi. Eve recognizes that the son she has is a gift and she names him accordingly. But she says here, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Now in just about every Bible, this with the help of the Lord is italicized. And it should at least be italicized if not absent from the text because it's nowhere in the text. Anywhere, in any manuscript in Hebrew, it's added by almost every translator to try to make sense of what's going on here. And the reason they need to make sense of what's going on here is because they're trying to apply a preconceived theology rather than reading their theology out of the text. Because without this phrase, with the help of, what we read is, I have gotten a man-child, the Lord. Eve believed that she gave birth to the Lord. When God promised her that a man would come from her who would conquer the serpent, she understood that this was a promise of a God-man, of something not under the curse of Cain or under the curse of Adam, something that could withstand evil. But again, this is poor application because her son was conceived from Adam. Her son was not conceived by the help of the Holy Spirit. So whatever it is, with the help of, or simply a man-child who is named the Lord, Eve poorly applied the theology that she had to her situation. She took something out of context and she put her hope in it. And we see that that was her hope because the next child she has, she names Abel which means vanity, breath, nothingness. We get the sense here of disappointment. That she gave birth to Cain, whom she thought to be the Lord, and she must have realized very quickly, this is no Lord. My mom had a book called Raising Cain. I never read it. I know she got it because of me. <laughs> but I wonder what... Eve thought that although life is going to come from her and she'd have pain in childbirth and she has this continuity of life coming through her, yet she looks at this perhaps violent child, at least petulant child, rebellious child. This child who, unlike her and Adam, has not been saved through faith, has not been brought into the family of God. One more bit of evidence here that Eve thought she gave birth to the Lord is that the same exact construction is used for naming Abel. It is not she gave birth to his brother with the help of Abel. She gave birth to his brother and his name was Abel. The structure is the same. Eve conceived and bore Cain, a direct object. Eve obtained a man child and his name is the Lord. Eve bore his brother, or Cain's brother, and his name is Abel. What he is called is Abel. Moses is very good at drawing distinctions when he wants to make distinctions. When there's something that we could draw a connection to, but shouldn't, he's good at changing the structure of the Hebrew, or he's good at changing the words used in fact, we're going to see one of those this morning when we look at Abel's task, which was to keep the flocks. He uses a different word than what Adam was instructed to do in keeping the garden, or what the angels were instructed to do in keeping the garden from man. Moses is a very careful writer, and he has structured in two verses three identical patterns. 
each dealing with a direct object. Eve thought she gave birth to the Lord. So her faith was in the proper object, on the proper basis, and even in the right content that she applied it wrong. Wrong application of doctrine is not necessarily a salvation issue. She had faith in God's promise. She did not fully understand what God's promise would entail in her life, but she trusted him. She was hasty, but she did trust him. And her faith here comes through demonstration after God has clothed her in skins, but her faith would have existed before God clothed her with sins. This is simply a demonstration of that faith that already exists in her. She named her child based on the faith that was in her, based on the hope that she had, the anticipation that she had of God's promise coming to full fruition. She just thought it would come a little faster than it did. And we do that too. We know that there are promises for us in this life as well, and sometimes we expect them a little sooner than God is going to grant them to us. Sometimes we expect an answer that's applied different than the way God is going to apply it. And so we set our hopes on something like Cain, or like uh, Eve set her hopes on Cain. And that was not the son through whom God would fulfill his promise. And it's not the son in whom God would fulfill his promise. So we want to, in our interpretation, leave room for God to show us what he means and not draw hasty conclusions. And each of these sons had different occupations in their life. Both of these things were probably occupations that Adam held, that he would have passed on to these children. Some commentators like to say that uh, Abel had a more noble office than Cain, or that Cain had a more noble office than Abel. But it's pretty telling that they're split half and half. Neither one of these are necessarily better or worse than the other. Abel was a keeper of the flocks. He was a shepherd. Throughout most of scripture, shepherding is a humble and lowly service, a lowly office. And Cain, being a tiller of the ground, is identified with the curse, where Adam was cursed to till the ground, to suffer and to sweat in order to survive. What we see here is not one brother elevated above another, not one brother predisposed to salvation and the other predetermined to hell. But what we see is two men under the curse, toiling in this world plagued by sin. The distinction is going to come in their response. How do they respond to God's grace? And the response has to do with their responsibility under the dispensation of conscience. They have a stewardship on this earth, and part of their stewardship is approaching God in the proper manner, by the proper means, in the way that God instructs. This is different from dispensation to dispensation, but it is always on the basis of sacrifice. For us, we approach the throne on the basis of Christ's finished sacrifice on the cross. For the Jews, they approached God through the temple sacrifice. For Cain and Abel, for Adam and Eve, they approached God, likely at the gate of the garden, with a blood sacrifice. This was their responsibility under this dispensation. But we see that they did not both bring the same kind of sacrifice. They did not both listen to God and take him Seriously, only one did. So in Genesis 4, verses, verse 3, we see, So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground, and Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. In the course of time, literally in the Hebrew reads, at the end of times. But this is a Hebrew phrase that means at the set time at the time of termination, not necessarily of all times, but we could say at the appointed time. 
there seems to have been a specific time passed down to Cain and Abel that they were supposed to bring this sacrifice. Some say this might be a coming of age sacrifice. We don't know. We haven't been given that detail. We only have this bit of evidence that there was a specific time that it was supposed to be brought. But we understand that it is a ritual sacrifice, probably not something that was ad hoc or willy-nilly, but something that was brought at the right time, at the right place, being the right sacrifice. And what did Cain bring? He brought the fruit of the ground, and Abel brought the firstlings or the fat portions. Some try to identify this and say, well, Cain brought from his work and Abel brought from his work. Well, what Abel brought wasn't good because it was from the work of his hands. In fact, quite the opposite. What Abel brought was the sacrifice prescribed by God. Had the roles been reversed and Cain were the keeper of the flocks and Abel the tiller of the ground, Cain may have brought the first things of the flock or he may have brought anything else. Perhaps he would have just brought wool. We don't know. But Abel, being the man of faith that he is, would have gone to his brother and got a lamb or got a goat. The word here, zone, means both goat and sheep, which Abel brought. Abel wasn't justified because he brought the best of what he had, and Cain because he brought the least of what he had condemned. Abel was justified because he brought what the Lord had required him to bring. Being that this is at an appointed time, it may be cyclical. This may not have been the first sacrifice brought before the Lord by Cain and Abel. But this is at least the first time that the wrong sacrifice is brought because there are consequences to Cain. Cain may have previously purchased from Abel a proper sacrifice and brought it before the Lord, though he would not have done so in faith. He would have done so in duty. But here he decides Abel gets to bring something from his own hands. So I will bring something of my own hands. Cain makes the same misconception that many of us do when we read this and think it has to do with their occupations and not with the Lord's occupation. In Hebrews eleven six, we read that without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Abel came on the basis of faith. Abel believed in God. He believed in the proper means of approaching God on the basis of a sacrifice. And that sacrifice had to include blood. In Leviticus 17, which the Hebrew people would have received probably around the same time as they received the book of Genesis. They would be reading these together. We see that for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. It was the life of man that was taken from him by sin. And so it is the life of a living creature that has to atone. Now this is simply expiation of guilt. This is the taking away of guilt for proper service to the Lord. The only sacrifice that takes away their sins so that they might be before the Lord for eternity is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, a kinsman redeemer, untouched by the curse untainted by the sin nature. In Genesis 3, 20 through 21, we see that first sacrifice that was brought. We looked at this last week. It says, now the man called his wife's name Eve. He was demonstrating his faith in the Lord because she was the mother of all living. After Adam demonstrated his faith, God gives him a means of covering his guilt 
so that he might be prepared for service to the Lord in his fallen nature. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Clothing them didn't save them. Adam naming his wife didn't save them. But the faith that Adam had, which produced the response of naming Eve after God's promise, was the faith that saved them. And God responded in kind by taking away their guilt. The same happens for us. Though we are in a different dispensation, a different age, with further revelation of who this God-man would be that takes away our sins, we come to him on the basis of Christ's blood, and we confess our sins. It's not our confession that takes away our sins, but the faith that leads to confession that takes away our sins. And when we confess, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We confess those sins we know. But how can we confess the sins that we are unaware of? God understands that. When we confess those sins which are brought to our attention by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness so that we can be fit for service in this world and in the next. In Genesis 3, 7, we see that Adam, after he fell, understood his nakedness and so attempted to clothe himself with fig leaves to cover his nakedness. But when the Lord appears in the garden, he hides. He does not bring this false covering before the Lord. He does not say, it's okay, God, I sinned, but I fixed it. He understands that the God he stands before is righteous and holy and mighty and that he has fallen. And that nothing he can put together by his own hands can cover his sin. He understands his sinfulness, but Cain does not. Cain does not understand that the offering he is bringing before the Lord does not demonstrate faith. It demonstrates rebellion. And so one brother is about to be accepted while the other denied. The Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. We don't know how Abel and Cain knew that the Lord had regard or no regard for their offering. Some, again, postulate that the Lord sent down fire to consume Abel's but not Cain's. We don't know. The text doesn't tell us. And in fact, when the text is silent, it's smart for us to be silent as well. Because we have to remember this was written for a specific people in a specific time and for a specific purpose. And the author of this book is Moses, and the audience is Israel. And although these events are historic, the purpose that Moses is writing this book is not a historical record for curiosity's sake. But it is pedagogical. It is for the purpose of teaching Israel. And where the event would not necessarily teach Israel, Moses does not include it. So however, they understood their acceptance. Had Moses recorded it, perhaps it would have confused Israel. Perhaps they would have looked for a different confirmation than they received in the temple sacrifices. But whatever it is, Cain understood that God did not accept his offering. Oops, I just explained that. Cain understood. And I kind of lean towards the idea that Cain would have understood because his guilt was not removed. When we come before the Lord and we confess our sins, there is a spiritual reaction. There is a falling away of the guilt that plagues us, that conviction that we feel for the wrong that we've done. Whoops, let me read this. Hebrews 11.4, 
Cain, just like Eve, is only mentioned four times outside of Genesis, or three times outside of Genesis, four times total. Here in Hebrews 11, verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. What made Abel's sacrifice different was the motivation of faith, the motivation to bring the proper sacrifice. Faith produced the correct response to God. So that Abel's service, because of his faith, was accepted, whereas Cain's service was not. There are many places in scripture where we can see an improper sacrifice being offered. Many in different dispensations as well. The way that all fallen man approaches God is on the basis of a blood sacrifice. For us, that's Jesus Christ. We know his name. We know who he is. We know that his work on the cross to save us is complete. And if we bring any other sacrifice before the Lord besides Jesus Christ, it is not accepted. If we come to the finish line having never put our faith in Jesus Christ and say, but Lord, I served you well, we'll be like the Pharisees to whom the Lord says, I never knew you because they never came to him on the basis of faith but they came on the basis of their works. And so here in Leviticus, we have the record of Nadab and Abihu, who were sons of Aaron in the Levitical priesthood. And they had just received their commands of how they were to perform the sacrifices in the tabernacle. And they chose, apart from the revelation of God, to offer a sacrifice not prescribed by the Lord. They offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And God's response, fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. When looking at how God deals with Israel, he's a lot harsher than he is with Cain. He's going to extend to Cain far more grace To King Saul, who was removed from his kingship because of an improper sacrifice. You know, Solomon does the same thing. But Solomon has a promise because of his father David that God will not remove him from the throne. So thank goodness for Saul's, Solomon's dad, because Solomon's dad is the only reason Solomon remained king. You might even say Solomon was a worse king than Saul. They come pretty close. They were both idolaters. They both, especially towards the end of Solomon's life, had low regard for the holiness of God. But here, King Saul, the first king of Israel, from the tribe of Benjamin, not from the tribe of Levi, not permitted to bring a sacrifice before the Lord, He brings a sacrifice before the Lord because Samuel, the prophet, a son of Levi, doesn't show up in time. And Saul has an army before him that he wants to go conquer, that he wants to go defeat. And he knows he's supposed to bring an offering before the Lord, but it's not him who's supposed to offer it. He disregards God's commandment. He disregards the way God has prescribed for him to bring that sacrifice forward. And so God rips the kingdom from Saul's hands and hands it to another. And this is what Samuel says to him when Saul pleads with him. He says, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. It is not simply the sacrifice that's brought, but it is the condition of the heart and how it is brought.
in Jude 11, which we did this last summer. We spent quite a bit of time, a whole sermon in fact, in Numbers 16, looking at the sons of Korah. What did they do? And why was Jude relating them to false teachers in the church? He said, woe to them, those false teachers, for they have gone the way of Cain. This is one of our three references to Cain in the New Testament. Interestingly enough, they all appear in the general epistles, not the epistles of Paul, but in the Jewish epistles. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Well, Korah was a lot like Cain. The only difference being, Korah was on this side of salvation, and Cain was on the other. God still has requirements for those in the family of God to be obedient to him. And sometimes, like with Nadab and Abihu, and like with the sons of Korah, God is harsher with his children than he is with those outside. Because those outside, their death is final. At their death, they don't go into the presence of the Lord or go into the bosom of Abraham in the Old Testament awaiting the Lord. And so these sons of Korah, out of whom God makes an example in early Israel of rebellion, these sons of Korah who have probably read the record now of Cain, they come up to Moses and to Aaron, and they grumble, they complain, and they say, why should we listen to you? Has the Lord spoken only to you? They say, all of the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. Korah has determined this himself. The Lord has said in this passage that Israel is not holy, that Israel has not walked in his commandments. So once again, man is acting as the arbiter, contrary to God's interpretation of the facts. And so Korah says, despite what God has said, we are indeed holy. We are indeed sanctified. They come before the Lord wearing nothing but fig leaves, and they offer a sacrifice of the fruit of the ground. They are, in essence, thumbing their nose at God's word, at God's prescribed manner of approaching him. And so Moses pleads with the Lord. And he pleads with the Lord to spare Israel from this rebellion of Korah, not to wipe them all out because of this rebellion. And the Lord says to have them bring their fire pans and to offer a sacrifice, and he will accept those who are holy, and he will not accept those who are not. It says, even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. He will draw them closer but he will not regard the offering. Moses pleads with the Lord. The offering that they bring, not in faith, an improper sacrifice, do not regard their offering. He says, I have not taken a single donkey from them, nor have I done any harm to them. Korah's rebellion is from within. Korah's rebellion comes from the heart of this stiff-necked people. It grumbles against the Lord and the Lord's chosen. And where do they meet? But at the tent of meeting, in the presence of the Lord. Just as Cain and Abel likely offered their sacrifices at the gate of Eden where the presence of the Lord remained. So here, the offering is brought to the entry of the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation of Israel. This is not the only time the glory of the Lord appears to all of Israel. In fact, this is not the first time that this has happened. And the first time, they were terrified as well. And so terror does ensue 
and so does destruction. In fact, Moses says, just to make it extra clear that this judgment is from you, do something brand new, do something you've never done before, and open the earth to swallow the rebellion. And so the sons of Korah are swallowed by the earth and all their possessions, but those 250 who brought an improper sacrifice to the Lord. It says, fire also came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. The Lord's judgment is sure. And the Lord takes seriously the proper sacrifice. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to see what happened to the world that began with the rebellion of Cain. Just how bad things could get. And through the course of Genesis 4 through 11 now, we're going to see why God needed to pull out a peculiar nation, this people of Israel. And so we understand why God acts harsher with Israel, because he needs to squash this sort of rebellion early on, because they seem already predisposed to rebellion. And it's going to be by the glory and the might of God alone that he is able to turn this people towards him to soften their hearts in fact, to give them new hearts. He picks a rebellious people, a small people, and he deals harshly with them as a father deals harshly with a petulant child. But he is bringing them into obedience. He is bringing them into faith. And this, for them, is just the beginning in Genesis and in the Pentateuch. This is for their instruction for all their generations. And this is where it begins, here in Genesis. What, then, was Cain's response? When the, Lord told, or when the Lord demonstrated that Cain's offering was not accepted, was he worried? Was he afraid? He was angry. He was not repentant. He was angry. Now again, Cain has no evidence of being saved. But we all, in this room, through faith alone, have assurance of our salvation, have eternal security in the finished work of Christ. But we are still plagued by many of the same sins. Because although we are rescued from the penalty of our sin, we still encounter the power of sin. We are loosed from it so that sin does not have to rule over us. But in almost every epistle, we are warned against letting sin have its foothold, letting Satan have a foothold. That warning comes because it is possible for a Christian to act like a non-Christian. In fact, I've heard it said that some Christians act worse than non-Christians. So we're going to look at a few passages here in James and recognize that these verses are directed towards saved people. It says in James, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but it is earthly, natural, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there is disorder in every evil thing. Now these passages could relate directly to what's going on in Cain's heart. That Cain is allowing sin to fester, and God is offering him grace. But sin, because he's holding on to it with his bitter jealousy and his selfish ambition, he has the improper motivation. And this motivation, this earthly, natural, and demonic motivation is driving him towards rebellion. And that rebellion is a sin against God, and the end of that rebellion is death. And Cain spreads that death, so it's not just affecting him, but those around him. In James 4, 2, it says, You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. 
You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Again, this is James speaking to a congregation of believers. So even when we read something like the account of Cain, there is application to be drawn for it, uh, brought forth from it for us. In fact, 1 John chapter 3, 11 through 12, another epistle directed towards believers, instructing them how to live in the family of God, in love and in fellowship. This is our third reference to Cain in the New Testament and our final reference to Cain in the New Testament. It says, for this is the message which you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. This is kind of a chilling passage in 1 John, a book that is mostly positive, dealing with love for one another, dealing with right fellowship, dealing with our hope and our promise in the Lord and all he has done for us. But we do get warnings in this book of how not to act in the body of Christ. And just as surprising as it is that one brother rises up against his own brother in Genesis 4, so we should be surprised and heartbroken when one Christian raises up against his Christian brother. Infighting is possible in a church, and in fact, it happens quite often. And part of the reason that it happens is because the church does not preach the proper motivation often for service. It's often legalistic or to bring bodies in. They'll preach health and wealth. And these are improper motivations for serving the Lord. So when you see someone else blessed, you become angry like Cain. Why is the Lord accepting his sacrifice and not mine? Well, you have the wrong motivation for offering your sacrifice and you've brought the wrong sacrifice. You are not acting in faith. You are not trusting in the Lord, but you're trusting in the work of your own hands. And you're expecting an improper response from the Lord as well. Nowhere does he promise health and wealth. He promises trials and tribulation. He says, because the world hated me, so they will also hate you because I am in you. Cain's response is violent. Cain's response is slaughter. Sin didn't start out small and get bigger. There's an argument that it started with the biggest. And the biggest isn't necessarily even murder, but the improper sacrifice brought before the Lord, a disregard of the Lord's holiness, idolatry, false religion. And this led to murder. But the Lord, again, offers grace to Cain. He has not yet murdered his brother, but he offers grace to Cain. After Cain offers an improper sacrifice, the Lord says to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? God's again not asking because he's curious. He's teaching Cain. He's getting Cain to think critically about the situation he's in, just as he did with Adam and Eve when they fell. God asks, where are you? Cain or uh, Adam doesn't tell him, I'm behind the third tree on the left. No, he says, I hid because I was afraid, because I was naked. God says, who told you you were naked? And he points his finger at his wife, but he does admit to eating from the tree that he was forbidden to eat. And he says to Eve, what have you done? And she points the finger at the serpent, but she also admits to eating from the tree that she was forbidden. Cain's response is different. Cain doesn't even offer 
a sorry excuse for a confession. In fact, Cain is silent. Cain says nothing. Cain ignores the Lord. Cain's desires are in conflict. Cain does not have a biblical worldview. Cain has an earthly, natural, demonic worldview. His wisdom comes from below, not from above. And so here in our sequence of events, we move from the revelation of the proper means of approaching God to the responsibility of man, the human test under this dispensation, which is going to be to do all known good and to avoid all known bad, all known evil. Charlie, Charles Ryrie says of this human responsibility through sacrifice that during this, this stewardship, that is the stewardship of conscience, man was responsible to respond to God through the promptings of his conscience. That this was the primary means that God would communicate with them. And this is one reason, again, why I believe that they understood their sacrifices to be accepted or unaccepted through the removal of the experience of guilt. Because God, at this time, was working through their conscience. We get that from Romans 2.15. And part of a proper response was to bring an acceptable blood sacrifice as God had taught him to do. This human test of their conscience, the promptings of man's conscience, ends terribly. It ends in the first part of Genesis chapter 6. And in fact, the times get so bad that the end of our times are related to that time. It says, so it will be as the, the days of Noah. Because mankind, prompted only through their conscience, waxed worse and worse and worse. And evil grew out of evil and increased over the whole earth. We're going to talk about this more next week. We're going to look ahead a bit and see why God had to bring in human government. And then we're going to see some of the failures of human government in protecting life. But it eventually is brought in to protect life because the evil that starts with murder just gets worse and worse and worse with no regard for God and no regard for life. But God has a few more words for Cain as well. He says, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. So not only is he asking him questions to teach him, but in Cain's silence, the Lord also teaches directly and says, in essence, step carefully. You are about to pass the threshold. And sin is standing right outside that threshold, and it is ready to devour you. I think of the passage from First, Second Peter uh, that Satan is like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Sin here might be pictured as a crouching lion ready to pounce. Satan is about to get his foothold in Cain because Cain is not responding to God's grace. But Cain instead is trying to bring works of his own hands. Cain does not understand his sinfulness and the cure for the penalty of sinfulness. Now, there is one issue here that I have not been able to resolve in the text. And I want to be honest with you about that. Sin is seemingly not the antecedent of this possessive pronoun, its. Sin is in the feminine, and its, its desire is in the masculine. Now, the structure of this language is so that sin and its cannot be referring to the same object. But its is referring to whatever is crouching. And some have tried to solve this by saying that it's because whatever is crouching 
is a masculine noun, but we don't have that masculine noun here. So the best I can do for you is something strange is going on in this passage, and I don't know what it is. But we see that Cain is in danger of whatever it is crouching of mastering him rather than being master over it. And this is the same structure, again, as we had in chapter 3, verse 16, where the woman is told that her desires will be for her husband. So this sin, or whatever it is, its desire is for Cain. And you'll remember that because of verse 7 in chapter 4, we interpreted this desire that the woman has as a desire to conquer, a desire to dominate, an introduction of conflict into marriage. But here we're going to use what is uh, perhaps paradoxically circular reasoning to say that both of these can't fit together if they mean anything but conquering and domination over another. There are a few different interpretations of what this might mean. One interpretation by F.W. Grant, um, an old dispensationalist from the early 1900s, was that the proper sacrifice had been delivered by God outside Cain's house. That Cain had only to go and collect this offering and bring it and sacrifice it. That God had even brought that sacrifice right to his door. And now this isn't a bad idea but it doesn't fit with Genesis 3.16. We can't interpret both of those identical structures the same way, being only 11 verses apart, if we interpret the sacrifice to be that. God did offer Cain a simple solution, but I don't believe this verse is speaking of that simple solution being brought directly to his door. I think he is warning Cain metaphorically, of sin being outside his door and ready to pounce the moment he takes that step over the threshold. And finally, they are both in correlation with dominion or rulership over that object of desire. The woman's desire is for her husband, but the husband will rule over her. Sin's desire is for Cain, but there is no guarantee that it will rule over him. God has not structured it so that it must do this, but Cain has an opportunity to master it instead of to be its master, or instead of to be mastered by it. And so in closing here, we're going to look at some proper motivations for how we are to bring our service to the Lord. And the core of all of our motivation, the best that we can possibly bring him, has to be founded on the basis of love. That because he first loved us, so we love him. And it's on this foundation of love that we are able to serve him properly when we have come before him with the proper sacrifice, and that is Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ died for us out of love, then that love will be manifest in us so that our response to him should be as a child's response to a parent when the child responds appropriately out of love alone. This is the best possible Christian service that we can bring to the Lord. Some say that this is the most spiritually mature basis the most spiritually mature motivation is when we are in close, intimate fellowship with the Lord. And so we serve out of love, not out of duty or obligation, but because we seek his best, because he seeks ours. The second is gratitude. This is our reasonable response to the Lord. It's not divorced from love, but it does seem to be on a lower level, again, a good response is gratitude. We see this in places like Romans 12, where we have experienced through Romans 
5 to Romans 8, all that the Lord has done for us in our salvation, that he's not only taken us from the penalty of sin, but he progressively removes us from the power of sin as we allow the Holy Spirit to take a, to take a hold of us. But we see also at the end of Romans 8 that the whole earth groaning for the redemption of the sons of glory, that we will be glorified with the Lord. And then after a brief section dealing with the promises to Israel that will not fail, Paul says that it is our reasonable sacrifice to the Lord that we serve him, that out of gratitude we serve the Lord. Another is significance. And this is not necessarily significance in this world, but an eternal significance, that we are serving the purposes of God. This was one of the motivators for Jesus Christ in serving the Lord, that he seeks the will of the Father because the Father has this all in his plan. Now, Jesus Christ was the God-man, but he did have a human nature, not a sin nature, mind you, but he did have a human soul along with his unchanging godly soul. And in that human soul, Jesus Christ was obedient. And he was obedient so that the eternal significance of his actions would be wrought for the Lord, for God, for his Father. He was obedient. Another excellent motivator is rewards. We as Christians on this side of saving faith have the opportunity of our works building up rewards for us in heaven. Now, I don't have this at the top of the list, but they're not all necessarily in a logical order of most mature to least mature. But there are two different ways that we can look at our rewards. We can be fearful of our loss or absence of rewards. Or we can be looking forward to gaining those rewards so that we can cast them at the feet of the Lord. In Revelation 4.10, we see that these crowns that we will receive for our service by means of the Holy Spirit will be cast before the feet of the Lord for his glory. So these rewards we don't seek for our glory, but for his. And that is the proper motivation for seeking rewards. We might serve out of duty. Again, Jesus Christ mentions this motivator. And so does Paul. In fact, this seems to be a big motivator for Paul, that love, gratitude, significance, and rewards surely are not absent from his writing. But he does have this sense of duty, this sense of obligation. And it has to be on the basis of love. But he knows that this is his proper response to the Lord, that although we are not saved by our works, we're not saved by any responsibilities that we might achieve, we do have responsibilities in the body of Christ. We are not saved by grace and then get to go live however we'd like. Now we are saved by grace no matter what. But we have a responsibility, as Paul brings out, to live appropriately with that gift. Fear is also a motivator. Now this is not a motivator that sustains for a long time. This is a motivator that brings one back into fellowship with God. That when fellowship is broken, fear might be what motivates one to come back in. But if you are in a loving relationship with God, an intimate relationship, fear is absent from that. In fact, that's brought out well in 1 John 4, where it says perfect love casts out fear. And that is the fear of loss, be that the fear of loss of rewards or the fear of loss of fellowship. One thing we as Christians can never fear is losing our salvation. There is not one thing we can do to take us out of the double grip of God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son. Because there was not one thing we did to get ourselves into their grip. 
there is nothing we can do to lose that. But there are plenty of reasons for a Christian to fear when a Christian is acting rebellious. The Lord does castigate his children. Proverbs speaks of that. Romans speaks of that. That there might be temporal punishments for children in the body of Christ. Ananias and Sapphira are a good example. They're an extreme example, but they are a good example. If fear is your motivator, you may not be rightly related to God in the body of Christ. You may need to confess whatever sin is keeping you apart from the Lord. That is private confession to the Lord of whatever is standing in the way of whatever is causing you fear. Because perfect love casts out fear. And we want to be in a perfect love relationship with Jesus Christ. So I'm going to close with two passages here, one from Ephesians and one from Romans. In Ephesians 3.14 says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. This is Paul speaking of the proper motivation for Christian service. That we, when we are grounded in the love of Christ, are motivated to serve. That it is not a legalistic obligation for us to be about the business of our Father. But it is because of love for God and love for the world and to see them brought into the family of God that we serve him. Romans 5, 3 says, And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. Now this is in contradistinction to the passage in James that speaks about the process of sin resulting in murder. Here, our tribulations, our trials, when we are looking at them biblically, they bring about perseverance, they bring about proven character, and it brings about hope. And hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has given, whom He has given to us. Hearts through the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. I can't read this morning. Well, our main point. Let's look at it one more time. Sin gets a foothold where fellowship with God is not attained or maintained. And God's grace is always safe. Man's rebellion is always deadly. Love motivation keeps the Christian from rebellion. So on the basis of love, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first his will. And when you're in a right relationship with him, and when your fellowship is strong, when intimacy is growing, not by your works, by your deeds, by your actions, but through the exercise of faith, in tribulation, in troubles, that no matter what, we can always come to the Lord and know that he is there offering grace. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your gift of grace in all situations. That we have already begun to live our eternal lives on the basis of our salvation in Jesus Christ. And that no one can take that away from us, but we have responsibilities here in the body of how we are to live and how we are to approach you. We pray that you keep us faithful and that you bring us ever closer to you in intimacy with you. Uh, we pray all these things, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen.